Well, guys, we did it. We made it to the end of this kind of saga of the first eight seasons of Survivor. Technically, actually, it's the second seven seasons because I never did Borneo, but you know what I mean. And now we have reached the conclusion. Out of 132 players, there had to be some memorable and rootable ones. That being said, there's also Linda Spencer and Rob Zabaknik. And while I may do my least favorite players someday, for now I'm sticking to the positive with my top 10 favorite players of this era of Survivor. But no video like this would be complete without some honorable mention. So let's do a rapid fire round. Colby Donaldson, the cowboy everyone fell for back in late 2000 that just fell short of this list. Sean Rector, probably the funniest character from our cases who was as, as an underrated face turn for sure. Call it Clean Haskell, a high potential player from the first season who was robbed due to Pagong being a train wreck of a tribe. Helen Glover, who was one of the only reasons Survivor Thailand was even remotely tolerable. And Ken Stafford, the other reason why Survivor Thailand was even remotely tolerable. Anyways, moving on. When I first saw Teresa, I was expecting her to be the second coming of Tina, and interestingly enough, uh, Silas was actually cast by production as uh, essentially a, a Colby 2, which, yeah, didn't pan out for him. Luckily, Teresa was a fitting player to follow in Tina's footsteps, and if I had to describe T-Bird in one word, I'd say survivor. She was put through the ringer time after time, with this stark rivalry between the older and younger members of Samburu, which, yeah, the younger people kind of came out on top, at least at, at first. Of course, once the time came to merge, Samburu was in pieces while Baran was getting their act back together, and the paganging of Samburu commenced. Yet it was at this merge that something changed in her. She showed a less innocent side of her while still maintaining a sweet southern persona the audience had learned to love. Her overall likability paired with her not being uh, that big of a competition threat kept her safe all the way to the final five, where she was voted out as the last Samburu standing, but even then she went out in a blaze of glory as she desperately threw Tom, Big Tom under the bus, telling Lex that he was the one to suggest they vote out Lex a few tribal councils prior, and even though she still went home that night, Tom was voted out uh, next, so in a way, her move was kind of successful. Much everyone loved Heidi on her season, and the fact that she hasn't returned is criminal. She was the perfect fit for her tribe. She was hardworking and a strong asset competitively. Even more so, she took advantage of the tribe swap to form a co-ed alliance with Jenna, Dina, Alex, and Rob Sesternino. For the most part, she owned the merge phase of the game, with her head usually safe from the chopping block, when, whether she had a Unity or didn't. Even when things got dicey with Rob flipping the vote a different way every council, she still seemed pretty safe, even when she was the target. Now, of course, people would have wanted to see her make it to the end instead of Jenna, which makes it all the harder when it's Jenna who decides to stab Heidi in the back at the final five instead of the other way around. That being said, she had had she survived that night, she'd be in the same position Jenna was, having to win out on immunity to even think of making it to final tribal council. And I don't know if she would have been able to do it, especially considering the final immunity challenge came down to a photo finish between Jenna and Rob. Either way, Heidi was still one of my favorite players from the season, and geez, I must have a thing for players who came in fifth place. Now, when I first saw Lex, I was certain he was not going to make it that far, and boy was I wrong. I was going all off of first impressions, judging a book by its cover. They, teaches, they teach us in elementary school not to do that, so I'm very stupid. He had this punk, almost goth-like look to him, and I was guessing that he'd be a very aggressive and hard-to-live-with player. He then turned out to have a softer and more caring side to him. You know, he was a father, after all, and he really loved his kids and was almost seemingly doing it for them. He ended up being a great tribe leader, and his quick development as a player reminds me kind of of Bruno Aiello from Big Brother Canada 3, who also appeared to be kind of rough around the edges, but was actually a really nice guy and dominated the house for the first half of the season. Move over, Silas. Lex is the real Colby 2.0. What? He actually did worse than Colby? It's really hard to measure who played a better game. If Colby made it to the final tribal council, Lex felt just short in third place, but can you blame him? He had diarrhea. Sure, maybe Colby made his way to the end on basic charm and winning all but three individual immunities. Lex was immune for most of the merge too, but he did have some points right after the merge where he was vulnerable and did need to pull some strings to make sure he wasn't going, as he did receive some votes. This led to Lex playing a more vigilant and more cutthroat gameplay, which in the end I think would have actually got him more votes than Colby's gameplay did the season before. Then in All-Stars, he was more of a lone wolf, with Jerry occasionally eating out of the palm of his hand, before he was tricked into making a deal with Boss and Rob to cut her loose, which was exactly what Rob did to him only three days later. No, 
to this day, I'm not even sure why I liked this guy so much. He just seemed like he was a good person, a good competitor, and a good player, so I rooted for him. I think he's one of the most underrated players, which sounds crazy considering he didn't really do anything that big. I just believe he still had traits on display that would warrant him getting on a second chance season or just returning in general. As most players whose games were cut far too early in this era of Survivor, he was a victim to the Morgan pagonging at the merge with him becoming the first juror, placing ninth overall. You know, more and more, especially after watching All-Stars, I feel like Roger is sort of eclipsed by the worldwide phenomenon that was Rudy just the season before. So he didn't really get the love from the Survivor fandom that he deserved. In the first episode, he was targeted by some people, and by some people I mean the first boot, Deb, because he was a weak link. But despite him being the oldest male on both the Kucha tribe and in the competition as a whole, he was a great provider for his team and proved he deserved to say by facing some of his biggest fears. And as a matter of fact, it was the cliff diving scene that kind of cemented him as my favorite player from this season. Season. It's similar to what T-Bird would later do in Africa. He survived the first few eliminations of the Bakonging of Kucha, making it to, you guessed it, the final five. Here, Colby, Tina, and Keith all were planning to vote Elizabeth because she was the obvious physical threat over the two of them, but Roger put his head on the chopping block for her as she was his number one ally the entire game, and he wanted to see her have a better shot at winning, I guess. You know, that's one of the reasons right there. He was such a selfless guy that he literally gave up his game for his best friend. I mean, some people might think that that's kind of dumb, but it just shows the heart of gold that he has. Now, you know that this is a really good list when the number five spot is a player I was high-key obsessed with when I watched this season. Pascal didn't even do that much. He was just a nice older guy that everyone wanted to keep around. The fact that he won the first three tribal immunities uh, didn't hurt either, but his real gameplay begins at the swap when he, along with Kathy and Nalea, are sent to a now almost extinct Mata Amu. There, they basically eat Sarah and Gina for breakfast and conveniently mosey back over to the rest of the players for the merge. But little did they know that while they were away, the other four Rotu formed an alliance, and once Bo Rob, Sean, and Vesepia were gone, Pascal and his friends would be next. Well, it took them more than Boston Rob's uh, pleas to, for, to Kathy to get them to turn around in the other direction. But luckily for them, the next immunity challenge was one that easily shows the pecking order amongst the tribe. Even though Pascal wasn't the first person to think of flipping on the Rotu 4, I still credit him partially for the move that flipped the trajectory of the season on his head, uh, you know, because he was part of it. From there, he sails all the way to the final four, where a deadlock tie leads to a rock jaw, which sent him purple-handedly out the door, which was heartbreaking to watch, as he wasn't supposed to go that night, and if he did make it to final three, I think he stood a good chance of winning the million dollars. He still demonstrated a riches to rags to riches again story that was never seen before on Survivor, as he was, and he, he just was one of my favorite players to watch yet, I've, that I've seen yet. As he does, Rob immediately took advantage of the game, from the first time we ever saw him. Uh, controlling the votes and doing something we hadn't really seen before, taking out a physical asset early in the game for strategic benefit. And of course, you know, his gameplay on Marquesas, I feel, is a little bit uh, uh, underrated because, you know, he was on a tribe that sucked, and he, because of that, he went out early because he was, you know, kind of outnumbered. You know, it was all ruined when he was sent to Rotu anyways, all the good godfather-like work that he went through. As a matter of fact, he, like, they even in the promos for the season when it was on TV, it, like, they would have, like, they'd make the ads, like, a trailer for, like, a godfather, and they'd edit it in kind of a funny way. Um, he, he did try to make up for it kind of at the merge by enlisting all three separated Rotu to side with him and take out the ever stronger Rotu 4 alliance. Of course, they didn't listen and his torch was snuffed just short of the jury phase, but his scrappy Godfather-like playing style was just enough to get him a spot on All-Stars, which, of course, he dominated from beginning to end in probably, like, the best losing game, um, at least Final 2, at least, losing game that I think Survivor's ever seen. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, I honestly sometimes forget that Boston Rob didn't win All-Stars either. I, I do think that his success was in part due to the tribe he started on, that being said. But either way, he was one of the most deceptive and cutthroat players we had seen yet, which made it sad when his A-plus gameplay didn't pay off twice. Uh, of course, now he's played, um, like three other times since then. And, yeah, you know... I I haven't really se I haven't seen those seasons yet. So uh, his obviously his gameplay in those how he was in those did not translate over to uh this uh this video. This is just kind of how I saw him 
on these two seasons, and I, I really liked him, especially in All-Star. Bob was a real interesting player to watch. He was sort of the opposite of winners we've seen in the past, that he wasn't even the winner. He obviously should have won, but just like Lex, someone had to go on an immunity streak and ruin it. But even besides Lex, Rob was an excellent player for only his first time. He even tutored Matthew in the ways of the game as if he was a returning player. His one-sided obsession with Heidi was comical, and for that matter, he just had a more humorous outlook on the game. He was like if Jerry Seinfeld played Survivor. He basically invented flipping on alliances, even though Colby, Kathy, Malia, and Pascal sort of did it first. I can't really say that they invented flipping, though. I can't, you know, because Colby wasn't actually that tight with Jerry or Amber, as much as editing made it look, at least. And the Road to 3 were already on the outskirts with the rest of their tribe as is, so once again, I can't really say that th those people flipped on their alliance if they truly weren't part of the alliance. But Rob uh, Sesternino was the first master of that now commonplace maneuver, which despite his deceitful playing style, uh, um, I still think he probably would have won next to either Jenna or Matthew. Uh, then he took his great reputation and blew it all the way on All-Stars, being only the fourth to leave, third if you don't count Jenna Maraska quitting, and this was due to him being more lazy around camp, and also he just didn't have the numbers uh, with the likes of Boston, Rob, Amber, and Big Tom. There's just something about Ethan's gameplay that I really like. This mixture of being the nice guy and almost flying under the radar, but then jumping out and making a game-changing move when the time was right. This is exactly what he did in Africa. And for the most part, he stood in the shadow of Lex, but took out Silas when it was child's, like it was child's play when he had the chance. Once Lex was out of the picture and he was sitting at the final tribal council against Kim Johnson, you know, he didn't even really need to prove his case, as it was the first time that the winner was obvious from the start of final tribal. Uh, this was shown by how it was the first 5-2 to two vote in Survivor history, as opposed to the 4-3 to three votes we saw in Borneo and the Outback, and what we later see in Marquesas, Thailand, and All-Stars. Speaking of which, Ethan also played a very stellar game in All-Stars, in my opinion, at least least, considering he didn't have nearly as much power. I mean, he came in a winner. He came in with a huge target on his back, and he lasted a lot longer than I thought he would, and he was never really a sitting duck either. He, you know, he couldn't win. Yeah, yeah, I, I think even, I mean, even when he was the target, he still kind of found ways to stay in. I, I really think that he, I would say he had an underrated game play in All-Stars. Um, I think really the reason that he went out when he did he was, he was just a victim of circumstance um i think if things had played out luck wise i think he would have done way better uh, maybe even made it to the jury uh e even though yes he could not win a second time he still felt like he had a leg up on the other winners he had this swagger about him all the time and when you factor in the fact that he's also a cancer survivor on top of it all it makes him look like a true survivor and i did i just realized this now technically at least as of this point in the time of Survivor, at this point, Ethan was uh, held the record at, at this time of Survivor, in this era of Survivor. He technically, I guess you could say, he hold he held the record for the person to get the closest to winning twice, as he was the last winner standing. So he had gotten closer to winning twice than anyone else. Uh, that's obviously no longer true anymore, because two people have won twice. But yeah, um, just really great player. This was the guy who made Survivor look easy. He fully embraced being out there in the wild, and really that's what it's all about. He caught fish like he was some superhero or wizard, and he was so much of a provider and asset for his tribe that they actually tried turning on him more than once, and anyone who even spoke of doing so was almost immediately snuffed out. That's just the power that Rupert had. Of course, it didn't last long as Burton and Johnny Fairplay came to their senses and got the remaining Morgans to vote him out, but his legacy lived on in Sandra, who went on to win the million for herself, but kind of for Rupert in spirit. It was no question he'd be back for All-Stars, which, yeah, I'll admit he had a rocky start, too, especially with that whole um, building a shelter challenge thing. That definitely knocked him down a few pegs. But, you know, he found his footing at the Saboga Dissolution, and from there sailed to the end of the game where he was cut at fourth place by the unbeatable power that was Boston Robin Amber and also that really dumb move by Jenna Lewis that I ranted about in one of the last videos. And look, he even won the America's Favorite Player Award, which netted him six zeros in cash anyways. It's hilarious looking at his kids knowing that they don't even know that they don't have to pay for college now. Those little kids, his two children in there are just you know, completely oblivious to the fact that they don't have to worry about student loans for the rest of their life, and they have no clue what's going on. And here I am, sitting here watching it, 
knowing that I am going to, like, suffocate in debt when I'm older, and the real-life Aquaman can just do it for, you know, it's, 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 I feel very happy for them, and it's kind of a moot point now, because his kids are adults, but it's, it's a, it's, it's good, good for them, but it kind of stings for me, it's like, oh, man, I wish my parents won Survivor, uh, Survivor America's Choice, or whatever it was called, but that's the bottom line, Rupert's at number one, because he was without a doubt the most beloved player to come from Survivor, for now, <sighs> now, um, I actually wrote a clue for the next video because I, I do write clues, but I already kind of spoiled that it would that it was gonna be something on Survivor Vanuatu. I feel very bad because it was a it was a fire clue, and now I can't use it because you know the answer. You would know the answer anyways because it was fairly obvious. But anyways, look out for the first Survivor Vanuatu video. I'm really excited to get that done. I gotta I gotta stop this backup of videos. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. And I will see you at Yasser Beach.